Percy Lintott Foxwell was one of nine children born to Francis Smith Foxwell and Eleanor Jervis Lintott in July of 1858 in Islington, Middlesex, England. He grew up at One Cleesby Villas in Tollington Park, Islington, alongside his parents and siblings, Francis, Arthur, Frank, Eleanor, Douglas, Lillian, Susanna and Helena. Their father, Francis, passed away when Percy was just three years old. As an adult, Percy was a stockbroker and a well-respected member of the London Stock Exchange, practising at an address in Throgmorton Street. He specialised in South African shares. He was an avid golf player and was a member of a number of societies. By all accounts, he was well-liked and held in high regard by all who knew him. Percy married Beatrice Sophia Foxley and together had three children, Douglas, Isabella and Alice, residing at Manor Lodge at 39 Portsmouth Road in Ditton Lawn, Thames, Ditton, Surrey. By the turn of the century, Percy had lived at the villa for 15 years and was, by all accounts, happily married. He was described as 5 feet 10 inches tall, with thick black hair and a small dark moustache. On the morning of the 20th of December 1900, at around 10am, 42-year-old Percy travelled by train into London town before visiting his ill mother in Finsbury Park in the afternoon. This was something Percy did with his mother once every month. From the park, Percy sent a telegram to his wife, Beatrice, at approximately 7pm, telling her to have dinner without him as he would fetch some food at Waterloo Station on his way home. Percy was seen by witnesses at Waterloo Station, where he presumably dined that evening, however his movements following this remains unclear, as he never returned home and was never heard from again. His wife soon became worried for his welfare and reported him missing to police. Solicitor Pierce Jones analysed the telegram written by Mr Foxwell and nothing appeared out of the ordinary. According to an article published in the Sheffield Evening Telegraph, Jones stated that the telegram was, quote, written in Mr Foxwell's usual quiet style without any sign of worry or anxiety. The same article speculated that Percy had sent another telegram to another individual, however Pierce stated that this was not the case. Jones stated that Percy's disappearance had him at a loss, as there was no obvious explanation as to how or why Mr Foxwell vanished. His finances were in order, as were the stock shares for his South African accounts, despite the struggling financial sector at the time, and he didn't appear to have any worries in his life. Police immediately began searching for Percy, scouring nearby woodland and dragging the river in the Thames Ditton vicinity, but nothing of significance was found. It was suggested that Percy may have been victim of foul play, but at the time there was no evidence to support this, only wild rumours. Police suggested that Percy may have travelled beyond Waterloo Station, sleeping on the train home, something he did often, according to his wife, before travelling towards Hampton Court, where he alighted from the train before walking along the Middlesex Bank, intending to take the ferry across the river towards his home. It was possible that Mr Foxwell had perhaps fallen into the river and drowned, his body being dragged downstream. At this time, London had been suffering tremendous flooding, which may have been a contributing factor in this case. It would have been easy to lose footing on an unsteady bank by the river, especially under a dark winter's night. The night Percy vanished, it was dark and raining heavily, though it was not foggy. According to an article published by the Geelong Advertiser, Percy missed his usual train home that day as he had gone to pick some violets for his mother. At the time, a £500 reward was offered for information leading to the location of Percy Foxwell alive. 
His wife, Beatrice, who was desperately worried for her missing husband, went to clairvoyance for help, her first visit to one being on the 5th of January 1901. The man told Beatrice, after looking into a crystal, that her husband had drowned and would be found in the Thames, near some waterworks, within the next 10 days. Beatrice visited the clairvoyant again after 10 days had passed with no news, and they agreed amongst themselves that they should conduct a seance at Ditton Lawn, where the Foxwells lived. Two seances were conducted on the 28th and 30th of January 1901, during which the clairvoyant revealed that Percy had been randomly attacked walking through a field by a man and a woman, who struck him over the head before throwing him into the River Mole. The clairvoyant was certain that Percy had met with foul play, and that when his body would eventually be found, he would still be carrying his gold watch and chain amongst his other valuables. On the 31st of January 1901, the day after the most recent seance and six weeks after he mysteriously vanished, Percy's body was pulled from the River Thames, Thames Ditton, near the Lambeth Waterworks filter beds by a labourer named Thomas Tovey, who was rewarded with £100 for the recovery. The body was badly decomposed but still fully clothed. In order to identify the body, police looked at the man's clothes and belongings, discovering an expensive gold wristwatch still on his person. The watch had been gifted to Percy Foxwell by another member of the London Stock Exchange. Percy's personal butler of 12 years, Charles Earle, positively identified Mr Foxwell's body after looking at the gold hunter presentation watch which carried Percy's initials. He was last seen wearing a black suit and overcoat made by Thomas of Brook Street, a pair of black shoes and a black bowler's hat, all of which matched the clothing on the body recovered from the Thames. Percy also carried his golf season ticket on his person. An inquest into Percy's death was conducted at the Angel Hotel by the coroner, Mr Athelstan Braxton Hicks, who was more commonly known as the children's coroner due to the fact he was very conscientious in investigating suspicious deaths of children. He was also the son of the famous obstetrician Dr John Braxton Hicks, who first described false contractions in pregnant women as Braxton Hicks contractions. According to a police sergeant working on the case, there were no signs of a struggle on Foxwell's body and his overcoat and undercoat were securely fastened. Due to the fact he still carried his gold watch, it appeared that robbery was not a motive. Dr Abraham Wallace of Harley Street and Dr Algernon Lyons, who examined Percy's body following suggestions of foul play, concluded that he most likely died from drowning. According to the pathology report, there were some slight depressions on the left side of Mr Foxwell's head, though Dr Wallace could not say whether the depressions were made ante or post-mortem. A number of witnesses spoke at the inquest, including a confidential clerk and a cousin of Percy's, all of whom told the coroner that Percy was in good health and good spirits prior to his death. There were no obvious reasons to indicate that Percy took his own life. He was on good terms with everyone around him, including his wife and employees, and he himself was a sober man who never made trouble. According to witnesses at the inquest, Beatrice also had her own private funds, therefore it appeared extremely unlikely that she was involved in Percy's death, especially in regards to financial gain. Though foul play could not be entirely ruled out, Percy's death was viewed as most likely accidental drowning, but despite this, the jury at the inquest returned with an open verdict. They concluded that Mr Foxwell had drowned, but they could not decipher how or why he came to be in the river. Did Percy accidentally fall in after slipping on the riverbank during heavy rainfall, or was he pushed by persons unknown? If he was pushed, by whom and why? How did the clairvoyant know so much about Percy's death? The media were fascinated by how the clairvoyant, quote, solved Percy's disappearance. Was this purely a coincidence or something more? 
Did Foxwell's remains show any further injuries, internally or externally, which could suggest foul play? Ultimately, how the 42-year-old father met his demise remains a mystery. Thank you.